the museum um, by a very famous uh, artist. So go check that out. And there's also a bird watching field excursion that they have planned. So if that interests you, check that out. All right. So about our speaker. So this is Dr. Jamie DeGrullo. And she um, returned to her alma mater, NJC, in 2016 as our head athletic trainer and faculty member. So teaching sports and medicine students and providing health care to the 21 athletic teams has been her dream job. Prior to that, Jamie was the head athletic trainer at San Joaquin Delta College for almost nine years. She has worked in the high school and clinic settings and has the opportunity to work at the World Special Olympics in Los Angeles. Jamie completed her doctorate of athletic training at Temple University, where she focused her critically appraised topic on mental health, medications, and the neurocognitive effects on sports performance. She also earned a teaching in higher education certificate from Temple University. And she earned her master's of business administration from South University in healthcare administration and graduated from California State University Fresno with, with a bachelor in kinesiology with an emphasis in athletic training. Uh, before Fresno, she played soccer right here at NGC where she oh, was introduced to the athletic training profession. So join me in welcoming Dr. All right, thank you guys. Can everybody hear me in the back? Just double checking, making sure. And my mic's okay? All right. So thank you guys very, very much for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to present to you some environmental considerations that we deal with in everyday life, but also in sport. So a little bit of an overview um, of the different topics that we are gonna present on or that we're gonna touch base on today is hyperthermia and hypothermia, okay? So hyper, those of you that are in the science realm, hyper meaning increase, so heat illness, and hypothermia, cold illnesses, okay? Um, we will talk about altitude, altitude sickness, and how that affects sports and sport performance. Sun exposure, lightning. I don't know if you guys were here, but about uh, now, five weeks ago, our very first home football game, we had a lightning delay. So we ended up with two timeouts, not really, but, or two half times, but, um, and we'll go into that shortly. And then air pollution and cardigan dysrhythmia, a lot of big fancy words. Anybody ever been on a plane? Yeah, Basically, ever heard of jet lag? Okay, so that's exactly what that is. It's messing up your cardigan rhythm. All right, so jumping off right, right from the get-go. Um, we're in the Central Valley. We deal a lot with heat, heat illnesses, heat exposure, things like that. So this is something that I'm gonna spend a lot more time on. Um, hyperthermia, unfortunately, can cause death. It is 100% preventable for any type of heat, heat illness, heat injury. Um, so that's what makes me so sad and, and angry when we see in the news that um, somebody had a uh, heat illness and their organs started shutting down and they had to stay in ICU for several days. Um, the, the most extreme would be death. And unfortunately that's still occurring and it's 100% preventable. Um, the physiologically, the body is gonna continue to function if the body temperature is maintained. Remember, we're talking about homeostasis um, where we want everything to be um, copacetic. And our normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And in order for us to exercise and exert um, you know, any type of heat, we do increase heat. So when it's hot outside, we tend to be warmer and our blood pressure increases, our pulse increases, our respiration increases. So in order to dissipate heat and maintain homeostasis, we have to sweat. In order to sweat, we need to be hydrated. So we're kind of behind the ball if we're starting um, to practice or um, participate in our sport and we're dehydrated. Um, so with hyperthermia or heat stress, who do you think would be more susceptible? Old, the older population, the younger population, right? Their, their um, bodies maybe aren't necessarily fit 
not necessarily fit, but aren't um, used to staying in homeostasis or any extreme from hot or cold can kind of throw them out of whack. Um, those that um, have other health issues um, that are maybe immunocompromised can sometimes be more susceptible to heat illness. And then, um, so old, young, those that have uh, susceptible to illness, and then also those with large body mass, okay? Regardless of if it's adipose tissue or um, bodybuilders, those with large muscle mass or adipose mass, um, it's harder to cool down the body um, and they are more susceptible to heat illness or hyperthermia. Okay, so a couple of things to think about when we're talking about heat stress is metabolic heat production. Our normal metabolic function results in the production of heat, and that's going to increase with the increase of exercise or intensity of exercise. So it's one thing, you know, we're walking to and from class and we go outside and in, in and out of air conditioned rooms and it's hot outside. But now if you think we're putting on different equipment or um, sports apparel to be able to start exercising. And with that, um, we end up putting more layers on. And with that, the intensity of exercise, it, it, the more we run, the harder we run, the harder we exert ourselves, the more that we're gonna end up sweating, okay? There is conductive heat change, and that's when you have physical conduct, contact. Anybody ever go out to the bleachers and sit on the bleachers when it's hot, right? You kind of burn your bottom or whatever you're sitting on. Um, or, you know, when you go out to your car, anybody uh, have leather seats and it's all hot in there? And, and, you know, if you're not wearing pants or another article of clothing, sometimes that does end up going through. So that's what we're talking about with conductive heat. The other types are gonna be convective heat exchange where it's loss or gain depending on the circulating medium. Okay, so in here, it's really, it's not too cold, it's not too hot. Um, we've got an ambient temperature. I've been in classrooms where it's like, it's freezing and you get goosebumps even though you know it's 100 degrees outside or whatever the case may be. Or on the flip side, where maybe the AC doesn't work and you're, you walk in there and it's hotter in the room than it is outside and you feel like you're sweating up everything. So that's convective, whatever it is. We also use that in athletic training or in sports medicine when we deal with um, whirlpools. We have both hot whirlpools and cold whirlpools. Um, depending on what the injury is and what we want to accomplish in our goals, sometimes we'll do both as far as contrast and do hot and cold to kind of vasodilate and vasoconstrict on the injuries. Um, last thing with the heat stress is radiant heat exchange. So from the sunshine, anybody ever get a sunburn before, right? That's what we're talking about with that radiant heat exchange or one example of that. So um, with heat stress, you can lose up to a quart of water per hour for up to two hours. And that's if you're completely hydrated, okay? So if, and I have athletes that come to practice and they just finished with class and maybe didn't have their um, water bottle with them and our arteries started, you know, a little bit dehydrated, um, if they're, they're kind of behind the curve, that's gonna make it much more difficult for them to not have a heat stress or heat illness. So two different things, air must be relatively water-free for evaporation to occur. To occur. So um, I went to Fresno State for my undergrad. I, I, did, I first started here and just that, you know, an hour and a half south and that humidity, that humidity um, in Fresno you keep your windows up and the AC on all night because it is so humid. Whereas here we have the Delta breeze where we can open up our windows and let that breeze come through. So if we have too much humidity, if it's 65% humidity, it impairs the evaporation, okay? But if it is 75%, it stops evaporation. So you can be running around all you want and sweating, but if it's too humid outside, it doesn't kind of, um, cool the sweat and cool your body down. So those people, people who live in a, a lot of humidity are also a little bit more susceptible to heat stress and heat illnesses. Um, with sweating, 
it evap the, evaporates the heat loss. So our sweat glands allow the transport of water to the surface. And that's when we're hydrated. There's times where um, my athletes aren't all the way hydrated and they, you know, they were sweating and all of a sudden they're not sweating. And that goes into, we're going to talk about it a little bit into from heat cramps to heat exhaustion. Um, the evaporation of water helps cool down the body and remove some of the heat. And when radiant heat and environment temperatures are higher than the body temperature, evaporation or sweating through um, and ev having that sweat evaporate is going to be key in having us be able to cool our body down and to get back to homeostasis because it is warm outside. Okay, so with hyperthermia, there's a couple of things to consider. Equipment and clothing considerations. So I work in the sports world. We have 21 sports here at MJC. What are some equipment that some athletes will wear? Huh? Warm-ups. Warm -ups. They have their, their warm-up jackets, right? What about, um, what do they wear? What do catchers wear in baseball and softball? All that padding, all that catcher's gear. They wear helmets. They have their um, chest. They have their, their leg braces. Um, and then also think about in football. What are they wearing in football? Shoulder pads and helmets, okay? So they have all that additional equipment on. And most of our um, body with sweat evaporates through our head hands and feet. It can evaporate from everywhere, but we dissipate most of our heat through those. So one of the things that um, we tell, especially in football, is take their helmets off during water breaks. That way their the sweat from their, their hair and you know, all around their face can help kind of cool them down. Um, and that will help in that aspect. So equipment and clothing considerations. Um, Maybe they're wearing a ton of layers because it was cold outside, but they're warming up and they're starting to get warm. Um, sometimes they they kind of fight within themselves as far as, oh, do I want to wear um, long sleeves or do I want to wear short sleeves? It's going to be hot. It's going to be cold, things like that. So they're taking into consideration their equipment and their clothing. Um, dehydration. So I already talk with all of our student athletes and when they have game day, Game day is not the day to worry about hydrate. Yes, you, you need to worry about hydration all the time, but in order to be fully hydrated, you need to start about 48 hours prior to that event. And I always tell all my athletes, look at the color of your urine. So look in the toilet, see what color it is. If it's, you know, Gatorade, lemon, lime, orange, or, or yellow, that you're not necessarily as hydrated as you can be. It should be light yellow, almost clear. Um, and that's one thing that is a good guide for them to measure. If it's brown or you're, you're drinking a lot of caffeinated beverages or um, in sports, there a lot of times what they're dealing with is um, pre-workout. Um, and that also can affect their hydration status. Um, and then for hyperthermia, we're going to go over heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat syncope or heat stroke. And each of those have definitive signs and symptoms that we'll talk about and make you guys aware of that way if um, you know, you're know you out outside, and it doesn't happen just to athletes, it happens to everybody, um, but you'll be able to identify um, either heat cramps, heat exhaustion, or heat syncope, or heat stroke. So exertional heat illness, this is a table that is in the NATA, National Athletic Trainers Association. It's one of their position statements. Um, and I talk a lot about their position statements because this is the gold standard. Even if a school does not have an athletic trainer, these are the best practices that anybody can put into place. Um, this one just happens to be of the exertional heat illness. Um, so like I said, there's heat cramps, heat syncope, and then heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So I'll go into more of this in a little bit, but I wanted you guys to have a little snapshot. Um, and it's from least severe to most severe. So with heat cramps, a lot of times you'll see, anybody watch professional sports, right? Um, sometimes you'll see them run out on the field and you see them stretching the calves. That's usually the first indication of a heat exhaustion, uh, I'm sorry, heat cramps going into heat exhaustion, um, where our extremities start locking up. 
um, and we're dehydrated. So one of the things that we try and do is stretch the calf, stress, stress the gastroc and soleus in order to alleviate some of that pain and encourage them to drink water and or stuff with electrolytes in it. Um, heat exhaustion is the next one and it's a little bit more severe than the heat cramps, but not nearly as severe as heat stroke. And each of these have different um, core body temperatures. So um, it's not on this sheet, but usually um, heat cramps, you can still be the 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When we're getting into heat exhaustion, it's about 102 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And then heat syncope or heat stroke is gonna be 104 degrees or higher. And that's when your organs are starting to shut down. Um, they're too hot for them to be able to function. Also, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out or you know, raise your hand, or um, if you want, jot them down and I can answer at the very end. Um, so heat, preventing heat illness, I would like to say it's common sense, but it's not common sense for everybody. So we shouldn't really talk about common sense, but um, precaution, make sure we're consuming fluids. I talk about hydration, your urine should be a clear color, light yellow. Um, you should start hydrating two days before your big event or your sporting event, whatever it is. And then follow the other factors such as um, the, they say that you should have, you know, 16 ounces of water prior to sport and activity. Then when you have an activity, it depends on how strenuous the activity is and how long it is. Is it a hundred yard dash that's over in 12 seconds or is it a half a marathon or a 90 minute soccer game or things like that? So things that are longer in duration, you should stop and have water breaks or when you have uh, halftime, make sure um, as a coach, you want to make sure that everybody is drinking. Yes, they have a break. They should be drinking, but they don't always. Sometimes they're just too exhausted and they forget. Well, that's going to kind of exacerbate them from being able to not have a heat illness. So this is what I was talking about with the position statement of exertional heat illness. Um, it talks about heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat syncope or heat stroke. Um, and it's written by, so there's a lot of different authors, but um, the head author, Dr. Casa, he's with the Corey Stringer Institute. So um, Corey Stringer Institute, most of you guys look too young to remember, but in 2001, um, Minnesota Viking Corey Stringer um, was, ooh, don't quote me on this. He was a lineman. I don't remember if he was offense or defense, but he was a lineman and um, he passed away. He was in the NFL for 13 plus years and he passed away from exertional heat illness. So that was, you know, 22 years ago. And that was when um, people or, you know, coaches would only give water breaks for um, minimal minimal water breaks, or they would only use it as a reward. So if a team's doing bad, oh, we're going to skip the water break. You're going to grind through and power through. Okay. So that didn't help him. Plus he is, has a large body mass. So he, he, and then he was on the older end as far as an NFL, um, NFL age round range. So unfortunately he passed away. Um, and then uh, university of Connecticut, it, and in conjunction with Corey Stringer, his wife created the Corey Stringer Institute and they do all things exertional heat illness and go and travel around the world, talk with high schools because it seems to be high schools that sometimes are a little slower on um, you know, providing extra water breaks, especially when, it, when it's warmer outside. So they, they try and get out to the high schools and to youth. So a couple things happens when somebody ends up having um, a potential exertional heat illness. So the athlete collapses immediately after exercise. We're going to assess their responsiveness and vital signs. Is it something, is it a heat illness or is it something else? If it's something else, like they don't have their ABCs, we're going to, we're going to start CPR. If not, and they have their pulse and is breathing, we're going to ask them some questions. Okay. Do have what they eat prior to practice or game? Um, how much have they drank? 
what was food like the day before. Unfortunately, I'm finding a lot of times our student athletes um, don't have, oh, I didn't eat this morning. Okay. Or I forgot to drink and I just, I, I left my water bottle at home, so I didn't drink. Okay. That's going to exacerbate it. Um, so if they have a differential diagnosis where it's something else, we'll deal with. If not, um, I'm really only going to use rectal thermometry if they're unconscious. If they're conscious, we can have them. The, the most effective way to determine core body temperature is through rectal thermometry. Um, and no, it's not the the thermometers that have the mercury in it and, or anything, because we're afraid that somebody, if they were unconscious and they come to, that breaks and now they puncture themselves. So it's a special type of rectal thermometry, but we're looking. If it's 105 degrees, we're worried about their organs and everything starting to shut down. So we do what's called cool first, then transport, meaning we'll call 911 and have the ambulance en route, but we're gonna immediately immerse them in cold water. Um, whether it's the cold tub that we have in the athletic training center, one that we have on the sideline. If we don't have one on the sideline in our kits, we always carry um, a tarp. So we would roll the patient or the student athlete onto the tarp and do a taco method. It's not super ingenious or anything, but taco, you fold up the sides, you've got the athlete in there. We always have water out of all of our practices. So we'll dump the ice water on them to immerse them in cold water to prevent um, any further increase of their core body temperature. And the reason we do rectal thermometry is because we want to make sure that their core body temperature is reduced to at least 102 or below. If we don't do cool first and then transport and say we were just to transport, and I'm not knocking EMS by any means, but there's the potential for, it takes however long for EMS to arrive, then um, they have to do their assessment and evaluation. Then they load them up, transport them to the hospital. The hospital has to do their um, evaluation before they really get the opportunity to be able to immerse them in water. So that's why we definitely um, do require cool first and then transport. So we can remove any extra layers of clothes, rapidly cool in ice water and monitor the core body temperature. We wanna get it down to 102. Um, before we ha we send them off. So keep putting cold water, ice on them um, and check that rectal thermometry. Monitor for recovery, but then end up, we still wanna send them back to um, the emergency department and have them um, check the rest of their organs because organs could very well have been damaged with that um, exertional heat illness. Okay, moving along to hydration. Um, we need to make sure we're staying hydrated and Water is gonna be the best way, but I find my student athletes, oh, water's so boring. I'm so tired of water. I don't wanna drink it. Um, I want something with flavor. They have the little drop-ins or um, uh, we also do encourage, they can drink sports drinks. Those, depending on the sports drink, have a lot of sugar content. So um, it depends on what their goals are, or if they're worried about their weight and their performance will get more into kind of the sports nutrition aspect of it. Um, like I said, urine should be a light yellow in color. Dark urine is an indication of dehydration. And there's times where um, they're like, oh, it looks like tea or it looks like coffee. That means there's a lot of part, it's not supposed to look like that first off, okay? But it means that there's a lot of particles in their urine and they're not, maybe their kidneys not functioning properly or they're not hydrated enough. So 17 to 20 fluid ounces of water or sports drink two to three hours prior to activity. And like I said, seven to 10 fluid ounces right before activity. And then depending on what um, type of sport you have uh, as far as duration, um, you do wanna make sure you're drinking throughout. You don't wanna gorge yourself while you're drinking. Anybody ever drink so much that they feel like the water sloshing around in there? Yeah, that's not fun to be practicing or running around or doing swimming, doing your sport. So um, there's gotta be a happy medium. A lot of times when my athletes are already kind of behind the ball, they drink a whole bunch and feel that sloshing around, which um, isn't super comfortable. Um, there is also an athletic training association position statement on fluid replacement for the physically active. And that's where I got these numbers from as far as for the 17 to 20, seven to 10, 10 to 20 minutes before. Um, it does talk about, it breaks it down to specific sports. 
Um, and if you guys are interested in that, I can give you the links for that. Um, dehydration. So mild dehydration occurs with as little as 2% of body weight is lost. Okay. So for um, my 100 pound cross country athlete, they can lose two pounds within their um, practice and they're already starting to be considered dehydrated. Now it's a little bit more with say my, my linemen that some of them are 300 plus. And um, so there's a little bit of more wiggle room when we have a higher body, body um, weight content. But as little as 2% is gonna talk about mild dehydration. So with that, we wanna make sure we're educating them when we do have water breaks, we're encouraging them to make sure that they do drink um, because when we are dehydrated, it impairs cardiovascular and thermoregulatory responses. So when you feel thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's one of the later signs and symptoms, but dizziness, dry mouth, irritability, excessive fatigue, and then possibly cramps. Stereotypically, we get cramps in our calves, but sometimes we have people who get cramps in their forearms. Um, happens more often in my gym, um, my indoor sports. So like volleyball, basketball, sometimes wrestling, they'll get cramps in their forearms and their calves. Whereas stereotypically, most of my outdoor sports, it's usually just the calves. Um, we want to try and use common sense and move them to a cooler area. If it's outdoors, move them to the shade or bring them into where there's air conditioning, start removing any of those extra layers like the shoulder pads, like the helmets, um, things like that. And then um, return to normal weight and absence of symptoms. So we will give them usually a 16 ounce bottle for every pound of water that they've lost. So during the summer, when we have double days, um, for football, for cross country, for a lot of our sports, we'll weigh our student athletes. Um, and it, it's, it's all private. It's not like we're putting everybody's weight out there. Um, some are more sensitive than others, but we will weigh them before practice in whatever they're wearing. So usually like with football, we tell them, don't wear your cleats, your shoulder pads, or your helmet. Get on the scale, write it down. And then when they're done with practice, same thing, no cleats, helmet, or shoulder pads, get on the scale. Sometimes I've had people lose up to eight pounds. Those are my bigger linemen, but sometimes it's one to two pounds. So with that, we'll encourage them to drink one bottle of water for every pound that they've lost. Um, that doesn't work out, you know, a hundred percent with everybody, but it's a good indicator and a, and a good rule of thumb for, um, especially double days when they're starting to get acclimatized to their sport, when they're starting to get used to, um, those practices and, and exerting themselves so much. Um, fluid and electrolyte replacement. So the body requires two and a half liters of water daily with minimal activity. Okay, two and a half liters with minimal activity. Now you figure my baseball athletes who are practicing from one until six, 6.30, whether it's in the weight room, out on the field doing, and I'm sure it's longer than that, but I, one o'clock is when they're, they're supposed to start. I know there's early outs and things like that, but um, it, for somebody who is exerting themselves so much more, they need more than just that two and a half liters of water. An adult will typically lose about one and a half per hour. And like I was talking about, remember that 2% drop in body weight is going to cause them to be thirsty. So they're already starting with that mild dehydration. So these are things that we wanna think about. Um, if thirst is ignored, dehydration will further compound. And we've had people who vomit, um, nausea, they faint, and they're at increased risk for heat illness. So, um, if they are dehydrated and they're not, they don't have a lot of stuff or fluid in their stomach, a lot of times instead of vomiting, they'll do the dry heaving. And that definitely um, is not fun. And sometimes when you have a team sport, they end up dry heaving next to each other and not making a pretty scene. So sports drinks, flavors will increase their desire to consume more fluids. Um, there's a ton of different sports drinks, some have more sugar than others. 
Um, it will replace fluid and electrolytes. Water alone can prematurely stop thirst, but um, isn't necessarily gonna satiate them. And small amounts of sodium can help with retention of water. So before when people used to, you know, eat a whole bunch of salt or whatnot, um, they got away from that, but they are finding that that is still effective. Um, and sometimes we'll put some salt in, into water for our guys that are um, cramping a lot. We, we know usually by game two, game three, who our habitual crampers are. So usually we'll have um, special water bottles made for them um, to hopefully minimize that. Even though we harp on them, you know, and they do tell me, hey, I've been drinking all the time. My, my pee is clear. I, they just happen to cramp. And that's fine. We'll just work with it and try and keep them as healthy as long as we can so they can participate in their sport. Um, more sports drinks, they have different nutrient levels. So um, one of the things that I tell my athletes who are, um, they don't want a lot of sugar content and they, they're worried about their performance and they don't want that kind of sugar crash that some sports drinks give them, um, Pedialyte. Okay, Pedialyte now, um, I would want to say within the last six months have been advertising to the sports industry. We've been using that for forever where go in the, the children's section um, and get Pedialyte um, and we have athletes drinking those on game day. So um, they're um, not super abrasive for the stomach. They don't have a high sugar content and they do help replenish electrolytes. Um, exponentially. So Pedialyte is something that I do highly recommend. Um, more carbohydrates result in slower absorption. So think of what did they have for breakfast or for dinner earlier? Was it high in carbs? Maybe that's why they're not absorbing um, the electrolytes like they can be. Um, but it is, the sports drink are effective for both short-term and long-term um, at endurance activities. So before when I was talking about the half marathon person or the hundred yard dash, it's, it's good for everybody. Acclimatization. So um, we're fortunate, we're at a community college. We don't travel too, too far for any of our different sporting events. Um, when you're at a four year level or at a higher competitive level, usually they're traveling out of state. So one of the things that we wanna do is try and get them acclimatized to wherever they're participating. So um, a couple of things that they can do, if you can travel there you know, a day or two in advance, that would be great. But realistically, I'm working at the community college level they, they get a couple of hours, you know? Um, it's usually a day trip here and there, but it's nice, it's not too far. It's not like we're traveling out of state. Um, with this acclimatization, um, think of altitude, think of the weather, think of um, whether it's hot or cold, um, things like that. 80% of acclimatization can be achieved in the first five or six days with two hour morning and afternoon practice sessions. So when we start our double days with any of our sports, um, we do have a handful of athletes that maybe are coming from out of state. So we are really conscientious and we do have those um, weigh-ins as far as for dehydration um, to check on them, but also, and we check on everybody, but also just doing another check-in you know, we've had somebody from Oregon and Washington where they're used to a lot of rainy weather and they're not used to the valley heat. So it's kind of almost like a culture shock when they come here and, and they have much warmer weather. Um, but we try and split up our practices to have morning and if possible, later evening where it's cooler in the day for those acclimatization um, processes. Um, so a couple of different things, days one and two, we're, uh, don't, we don't have them. So with our football guys, we don't have them wearing their equipment. Um, usually we're doing single three hour practices or one, two hour practice and one, one hour on the field. Um, sometimes we break it up where they're watching film 
and then they go to the weight room for one practice session and then the other practice session is they're out on the field. So it, it kind of breaks it up and it starts getting them acclimatized. Um, days three and four, we'll start having their helmets and shoulder pad. Day five, um, they can wear everything. And then um, after day five, we're, they should be pretty close to being acclimatized, acclimatized. And we'll notice that in their charts, as far as their weight charts, they're not having that eight to 10 pounds of um, weight loss in one practice session that they did on day one and day like six, instead of that eight pounds, it were at like two or three. So they're getting more and more acclimatized or they're drinking more water um, preemptively um, for that. Susceptible individuals. So for um, acclimatization, those uh, with large muscle mass, those that are really are older, those that are younger, and then overweight. So death from heat stroke increases four to one as body weight increases. And that's, it's, it's a crazy statistic. And that's one of the things that's in the acclimatization position statement. Um, and those that have poor fitness, history of heat illness or febrile conditions, the young and the elderly. Okay, so those that have poor fitness, um, we get those too, believe it or not. Yes, we're in sports, we're in athletics, but um, they finished their high school season and then maybe were a couch potato all summer and then came back and they're not necessarily fit like they were a couple months prior. So we do get those that aren't necessarily in the best of shape and we just have to progress them a lot slower with these environmental conditions. Okay, heat index. So we've talked a lot about hydration. Um, looking at the heat index, so um, sunshine, what the temperature is, what the um, humidity level is, is all gonna play a factor into environmental considerations, especially in sport. So one of the things we use down at the bottom is a wet, wet, wet globe bulb temperature where um, it's, not, <laughs> it's much nicer now where you just press an electronic device and it calculates it for you. Back 20 years ago when I was a student, we'd have to use a sling psychrometer where um, we would have basically two mercury thermometers. One has a wet, um, gauze over it, the other one's dry, and you would swing it around your head for 60 seconds and measure that, okay? So it's so much easier now, um, but we take these things into consideration. And if we know, like usually during the summer, um, there's some summer weeks where people are talking about, oh, we're gonna have um, a heat spike and they're cautioning us to use, you know, minimal energy or make sure you're using your dishwasher and stuff late at night so we can avoid any type of brownouts or blackouts. So same thing with the wet bulb globe temperature. We're looking at this ahead of time to see if there, you know, if maybe we should change game time, right? So um, if we have game time during the hottest part of the day between one and four, um, and we know that it's, you know, 100 plus degrees plus however much humidity, that's going to make it feel even warmer than it is outside. So it might behoove us to change games time or practice time to something either earlier on in the day, if you can, or later on in the day. When we're talking about games, it's stereotypically going to be later on in the day because we have teams traveling from not super far away, but we want to minimize any type of time that they're away from their classroom. A um, couple of different things. There's a dry bulb, which is a standard mercury temperature. A wet bulb, like I said, it has wet gauze that is swung around in the air. And then a black bulb, which all of these together will form formulate um, and do the equations for us and tell us where we're at, if we're in danger or if we should change practice time. Am I on time? Okay. Um, this is one of the things. Heat cramps. There are painful muscle spasms, stereotypically in the extremities. You'll have a ton of sweating and the water and electrolytes will be depleted from your system. Whereas heat exhaustion, it's inadequate fluid replacement. This happens more often with our athletes that are um, maybe not taking water breaks, things like that. Um, symptoms include sweating, pale skin, 
elevated temperature, vomiting or diarrhea, hyperventilation, and progression of those um, cramps. Not always, but sometimes the cramps will pro progress more towards their quads and their abdomen. And that's gonna be something that's a lot more extreme um, and not something that we can stretch away. Usually that is gonna require them to go to um, urgent care or the hospital and get potassium bag or something to help replenish their electrolytes. And then the last one is heat stroke, where this is a serious life-threatening condition. Um, they are no longer sweating, so their skin is dry and hot to touch, um, and um, they don't have the sweat anywhere on them. So that's another huge red indication and red flag that we're worried about for um, anybody who has any type of heat illness. Um, we wanna make sure that they're getting fluids whether they're drinking it, sometimes we have to take them to the hospital and they have to get it intravenously, um, put them in a cool environment and try and elevate their lower extremities so everything is kind of within their torso. Okay, anybody here of rhabdo, rhabdomyolysis? Okay, so this is kind of something that we dread within um, sports and athletics. It um, occurs during intense exercise with heat and humidity, and it will have gradual muscle weakness. Um, the urine will be dark and pot potentially having renal dysfunction. A severe case, renal failure, sudden collapse, and death. So usually you hear where um, athletes are having really, really hard workouts. They're going hard in the weight room. They're not getting any um, water breaks, and they're just working out going, going, going. Um, and possibly they haven't been acclimatized to that particular scale of lifting weights and, and everything. So um, like I said, it it's, happens with skeletal muscle is degener degenerating and um, ends up causing people to have to go to the ER amb via ambulance. Um, unfortunately, we have it, we don't have it, but um, you see or hear about articles where it's like um, six people from a softball team or seven people, it's usually in groups. And that's just because um, they're, they're working out so hard and not giving any type of relief or break. Hyponatremia, so hypo, remember, is lower, but this is a little different. This one is too much water intake. So hyponatremia is a fluid and electrolyte in, imbalance, and it means there's not enough sodium within their um, fluid. So um, there was something, this is dating myself, but um, when the Nintendo Wii came out, probably now 12, 13 years ago, whenever that was, um, there was a radio station, actually it was somewhere local, and they had something where, don't pee for the Wii, where they tried to see how um, all these contestants would drink so much water, and, the, and if you peed, you would not get to, to win the Nintendo Wii. So a lady actually ended up passing away from hyponatremia because she drank so much water, and her sodium potassium pump became out of whack. Um, and she had exertional hyponatremia where she drank so much water. They start getting a headache. Um, there's not enough sodium within them and it, their organs start failing and, sh and um, shutting down. So progressively worsening headache, nausea, vomiting, and then swelling of hands and feet. Um, and then their, their personality, they start getting agitated and things like that. Um, cold injuries. So this is one of the, I, I'm doing cold injuries and then lightning. Um, so another position statement on environmental cold injuries to, um, we don't have to deal with this too, too much in Modesto, but our counterparts up at Columbia do possibly have to deal more with the cold injuries. There's a couple of different things. Frost nip, which is going to include the extremities, toes, fingers, ears, um, nose, and then hypothermia, where that's the core body temperature is decreasing. So with hypothermia, think of colder weather too. If it's wet and rainy outside and you happen to be wet, and then there's wind chill, that makes you feel even colder. You'll have the involuntary um, you know, shakes and shivering. Um, 
Most activity allows for adequate heat production and dissipation allowing for sufficient functioning, but sometimes people are just too cold or cold to the core. And that's when we want to kind of, again, using common sense, bring them into a warm place, take off any wet clothes, replace it with dry towels or um, dry blankets and try and warm them up. Um, so when you deal with wind, wetness, chilliness, it can increase the chances of hypothermia. So 65% of body heat loss through radiation and 50% of that is through the head and neck. Remember before when I was talking about with heat illness and we have them take off their, their helmets and stuff, same thing with cold. So we might wanna have them wear a hat or um, a beanie or something like that. 20% of heat loss is through evaporation, and most of it is through the skin, although a third of it is through respiration. So anytime our core body temperature, remember before I said um, we're at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we get below 90 degrees, um, we start to shiver. We have that involuntary shivering. When it gets below 85, so 77 to 85, death is imminent when our core body temperature falls below there because our at the cellular level, it's starting to freeze um, and shut down our organs. This is the cold temperature where we're talking about how many minutes. So right here at the top is what degree in Fahrenheit it is. And then on this axis, is wind in miles per hour. So if you know we're at zero with five mile hour wind, um, we frostbite is usually a little bit longer than 30 minutes, but we wanna minimize any type of that um, from occurring because we don't want that to happen. So make sure we're wearing appropriate gear. Um, waterproof and windproof fabrics are definitely gonna be positive for that and making sure that we have layers. We can adjust our layers as far as, oh, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. So those are things, it's always good to have layers and you can adjust accordingly. Um, altitude, okay, so um, again, we're not dealing too, too much with this, but when we go up the hill, maybe to Yosemite um, and hiking up there, it can and does affect some of our student athletes. They go up there for team bonding and things like that. Um, most events don't occur at extreme heights, but it can um, affect the oxygen intake that they have. There's gonna be fewer red blood cells than necessary to, to adequately capture the available oxygen. I'm going to go to lightning now. So emergency action plans. A couple weeks ago, um, usually we have a thing that's called the 30-30 rule. If um, you see lightning and then hear thunder and it's within 30 seconds, that means it's within six miles. So we need to um, evacuate the playing field. It's no big deal when we're evacuating the playing field for our athletes. They have to listen to us or they have to listen to coach and the officials. What we also have to do is evacuate the people in the stands because what are they sitting on? Bleachers, metal, right? So metal um, definitely is something that we're worried about with the lightning. So, um, and I liken it to like hurting cats. It's fine, we, we have all of our teams evacuated and then um, at the football game when we're trying to evacuate people in the stands, they're like, well, we don't have to go. I don't want to lose my seat or, or anything like that. And we're explaining, you will get your seat back, you know, everybody same seats, but you're sitting on metal or because it was kind of sprinkling that day, we, they have the pop-up tents. Those pop-up tents, now you have metal poles or stakes right next to you and you could potentially encourage, you know, the likelihood of getting hit by lightning. So um, it, it actually, there was no warning. There was thunder, lightning, one right after the other. Um, I guess it hit something in downtown um, Modesto, but we ended up with seven minutes left, 7.33 left in the second quarter. We had to evacuate everybody um, for at least 30 minutes. So what I was talking about with the 30-30 rule, if the thunder and lightning is within 30 seconds, it's within six miles away and you need to evacuate. And then we have to wait at least 30 minutes from the last time of the thunder and lightning to return to participation. Sometimes, um, usually in the Midwest, they're dealing a lot more with, with lightning and they have all these lightning apps um, to be able to tell them where it's at and where it's hitting. Um, 
so uh, for, fortunately, we were able to evacuate everybody, get back, and just finish out the game. Um, it's not easy evacuating a whole entire stadium. Um, so I can't even imagine what some of these bigger venues are doing. Um, one of the last resorts, we tell people, you know, get back in the car or if it's a team, they can get back on a bus because the tires are grounded with the rubber on the ground. And, um, you know, try and minimize any being away from anything that's metal or that's going to conduct uh, lightning. Um, so this is what I was talking about. 15 seconds, everyone needs to leave the field, but if it's 30 seconds, um, it's inherent danger. So, and when we're talking, it's one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. So not just super quick, but we wanna make sure, and I know it's a deputy downer, but we wanna make sure everybody's safe. And that's why we do have to evacuate with these environmental considerations. This was um, a lot of the information that I've taken was from the lightning safety for um, the NATA position statement. And this is just showing you, like I said, Central Valley, we don't deal with it too, too much, but um, you know, Midwest, they're dealing with it all the time. And these are things um, with the lightning and flash density with that. Almost done, air pollution. There's two different types. There's photochemical haze and smog. Anybody ever, um, we drove down to Disneyland a couple weeks ago and from the grapevine and you can see kind of like that layer of smog, okay. Um, those with um, pulmonary issues might have a higher, a harder time with smog and the photochemical haze. And that's one thing um, that we're dealing with when we have those fires that are close to us and, and it sends those air particles down our way. So when, anytime we have 150 um, PSI or PMI, uh, we end up, we no longer practice any of the outdoor sports. So we try and move them indoors if there's an indoor facility. If not, we just have to cancel those outdoor sports. And then the last thing, cardigan dysrhythmia. So, when we travel, um, and you can definitely get jet lag, depending on if you're going from east to west or west to east, but our body maintains a cyclical mechanism over 24 hour periods. When we go from one time zone to the next, um, our body has to adjust and our metabolism does have to adjust because we um, start getting used to the time zone that we're on. Now, there's different people will say, oh, if you're gone for less than two days and you're gonna return home, try and stay on your, your normal time zone. But that doesn't always work well, you know, if you're going for business or whatnot. So a um, couple of things to, to, um, to make note of is when you're traveling, you can have fatigue, headaches, digestive disorder, changes in your blood pressure, heart rate, um, and bowel habits. That's just because you're changing your day-to-day -day and ins and outs of what you're doing. So these are all things, you know, that we deal with in sports. Um, more so if, you know, when we go to state, we, we're, all, we're always competing in California. So we don't have to deal too, too much with different time zones. But at four-year universities, when they're going to different states, they do have to do that and think about their... Um, uh, getting acclimatized to that, not only that time zone, but to that area, the altitude and that weather. Um, to prevent cardigan dysrhythmia, make sure you're well rested, eat according to the time changes, make sure you're staying hydrated. Hydration is a huge key component. Um, for sports, try and maintain your training schedule. If you always practice in the morning, it's it might be mid afternoon, depending on where you're at, but try and, and practice or train at the same time that you normally do. Um, use caffeine when traveling west and adopt to the local time on arrival. Avoid alcohol before, during, and after the trip because that can exacerbate the cardigan dysrhythmia. And that is all I have for today. Does anybody have any questions on anything that I talked about? Yes. I have a question. Uh, my uh, so 
I'm wondering how, when, when is the best time to drink uh, electrolytes uh, for an event? So my daughter has a softball tournament this weekend, so we find three games Saturday, and probably two or three games on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So when's the best, and we usually have our hydrate like two days before. Perfect. Okay. Uh, when's the best 